All right, cool. Hey guys, Spud here. And today we have yet another recording of a one-on-one -on -one training session with one of my patrons. In this training session, the student wanted to go over the very basic foundational skills of flying the FA-18C Hornet. When I have students that are brand new to flight simulation or DCS world in general, I like to go over the fundamental skills of flying their chosen aircraft. From startup to takeoff, navigation and systems management are all high priorities on my list to teach these new pilots. Because DCS is a combat focused flight simulator, a lot of new guys want to jump straight into a dogfight or dropping laser guided bombs. But we can't do that effectively if we don't know the basics of the aeronautical environment we find ourselves in. Seemingly mundane tasks like properly receiving taxi instructions, navigating between waypoints or aircraft systems management are fundamental skills to being an effective DCS pilot and makes the pew pew stuff much easier, less frustrating, and more fun when we get to it. There's of course a very good reason why pilots being trained in real life spend months if not years learning to fly before they ever learn how to fight or see a live weapon on their aircraft. And it can be very difficult for those who are interested in taking a deep dive into DCS to find information and study about the flight part of combat flight simulation. This video was created using Thrustmaster Flight Sim Peripherals. Check out a discount code pin in the comments down below for their entry level HOTAS for those of you who would love to jump feet first into DCS world with the correct equipment. This training session was conducted on a Fox 3 managed solutions server. And man, they are the best, most hassle free to run a DCS world server. We have a 15% off code also pinned in the comments down below to help get your virtual air wing off the ground. So let's go ahead and get started, guys. I'm going to be facing a heading of 310 degrees when I'm on my approach to land, as well as you can, when you line up on the runway, check your heading and make sure you're actually on the correct runway. Because if you messed up your taxi instructions, then you could get in the way of other aircraft who are, say, trying to land or trying to take off. So I'll have you line up on the runway here and just uh, go ahead and hold on the runway while I get into position behind you. And I'm going to follow you out. We're gonna to fly to waypoint one and we're gonna climb up to 15,000 feet to start off with, as well as we are going to fly at an indicated airspeed of 350 knots. And if you look at your heading tape on your HUD, you can see we're at a perfect 310 degrees. So the runway number in front of your nose there matches our heading, so that's perfect. Okay, so what we'll do is you'll, for a takeoff in the F-18, the procedure is of course use full afterburner and you're gonna be going down the runway. You're gonna start rotating, which means pulling back on that stick nice and gentle, about 100 knots and then you're just gonna let the airplane fly itself gently off the ground. You don't wanna yank back and really rip that nose up because you might strike your tail on the ground. Um, another thing is if you disengage your nose wheel steering at about 70 knots indicated, that'll make your takeoff roll a lot easier because you won't be over controlling your directional control on the runway. Um, Another thing to note on the FA-18 is your airspeed indicator bottoms out at 48 knots, which is a little strange, but if you ever are taxiing and you need to see how fast you're taxiing, you can always look at your ground speed on your HSI, which right now is reading zero, which is next to the little plane symbol on your HSI on your MPCD. So that's pretty cool. Um, and we are good to take off. So uh, looks like it's going to be a slight left turn to a heading of, I'm sorry, it's basically going to be straight out to our, a heading of about 310 for our waypoint one. So you're clear for takeoff whenever you're ready. Okay.
Nice, looking good. Start that gentle pull back on the stick. Get that nose up there. Try not to leave the runway. Get, get those gear up, get those flaps up. Nice job. And try and pull her out of afterburner here. Just try to go for full military power. So that's going to be full power without afterburner. And when we're on our initial climb out, it's probably, especially with your with the wingman, if you look over your left shoulder, I'm right here with you. It's probably best to try and climb somewhere around maybe seven and a half degrees nose up. And when you have somebody trying to fly in formation with you, you want to be make nice, gentle movements on your stick, so that way you don't shake your wingman off. All right, so if we look up on our heading tape on our HUD, we're flying about 300 degrees. You see that vertical tick mark we talked about earlier on the right-hand side of your heading tape? That is yeah. your waypoint. So go ahead and bring that tick mark into the carrot on your heading tape. There you go. Nice gentle turn. I like it. And then start to roll out just before you get there. Beautiful. Nice job. Nice and gentle flying. I like it. Cool, and let's keep that climb coming. Let's go for 15,000 feet. Looking good. 2,000 feet to go. One thousand feet to go. And start gently bring that velocity vector to the horizon. There you go. Nice job. So you want to try to you want to make sure you're not overshooting or undershooting your altitude. It takes a little bit of getting used to to kind of get it perfect. Cool. All right. So hold that altitude of 15,000 feet. We've passed waypoint one, so let's select waypoint two and fly me towards waypoint two. Nice job, watch your airspeed though. You wanna be about 350 indicated. Cool, nice job. Right at waypoint one. Heading of about three, four, seven degrees or so. Try and pull that power back. Get us to 350 knots indicated. All right, once you get to 350 knots, we'll talk about how to use the auto throttle, which is super nice. It's basically like cruise control in your car. By default, it's mapped to the T key on your keyboard. And when you press it, ATC should pop up on your HUD. Beautiful. Now your jet is based, is in auto throttle mode. So the aircraft will attempt to maintain 350 knots indicated um, as you climb, descend, turn, all that good stuff. It will automatically modulate the RPM of your engines to maintain that airspeed. Uh, that's, that'll stay that way as long as you don't make any like giant throttle movement, right? Yeah, exactly. So if you slam your throttles forward or pull them all the way back to idle, they the auto throttle will kick off. 
it will flash at first and then it will disappear to let you know that it's gone. Next thing we can talk about here is the autopilot and different autopilot modes. So we want to press the A slash P push tile on your UFC. And then we got a whole bunch of options when it comes to the autopilot. The most basic one and the one you'll be using 99% of the time is B out for barometric altitude hold. So if you press the little circle button next to it, you'll see a little semicolon and that's letting you know that it is currently holding your altitude. Now, would, if we have an altitude hold mode on, whether that's barometric altitude, like B out, or radar altitude, R out, we can then engage what's called CPL, or coupled mode, where the jet will automatically fly you to your currently selected waypoint. So if you go ahead and press coupled mode, it'll fly you directly at waypoint two. Make sure you press, if, it, if the options go away, hit A slash P again because those options do time out. Pretty cool, right? Now it's just flying you completely automatically. Now on the HSI, where we select our waypoints, there's another button underneath those little arrows that's called that says sequence one, SEQ one. And if we press that button, it'll show the sequence of waypoints for us on our HSI. And so to fly your current flight plan that's loaded in the mission computer of your jet, you basically just have to fly your aircraft on top of that dashed line. So while flying in a flight simulator with autopilot turned on may be a little bit on the boring side, once you get into more intense things with your jet, like say trying to find targets with your targeting pod or setting up weapons, um, you know, guiding a cruise missile into a target, things like that, the autopilot will be very, very helpful. So you can reduce your workload in the cockpit and concentrate more brain cells on those additional tasks. Cool, we're almost to waypoint two, so let's go ahead and select waypoint three and your jet will automatically fly you to waypoint three. There he goes. So see how the autopilot is pretty abrupt and it kind of like slams you into that turn? Yeah. We can actually tell the jet to fly a little bit more gently and it's very, very easy to do so. The way we do that is on the top row of buttons on your HSI, you can select the data portion on the top right. This kind of brings us into all the different options we have available to us that we can change and adjust on the fly for our aircraft, our navigation, our TACAN stations, these kinds of things. So we want to select the A slash C option at the top and the second from the top on the left hand side says TAC blim. If we click on that and switch it over to nav blim, the aircraft will fly a lot more gently for you in autopilot. Cool. While we still have autopilot going on for us, why don't we go ahead and start setting up our bombs? So to set up your weapons, we want to go to air to ground master mode. That's air to air master mode, by the way. Cool. And so we can see that automatically populates our stores page on our left DDI. If we click on 83B at the top row of buttons, that's gonna select the four Mark 83 slick dumb bombs that we have loaded onto our aircraft. We also see a whole bunch of new symbology that's up on our HUD. The biggest thing that we need to take care of right off the bat is we need to make sure that we get our fusing set correctly or else our weapons aren't going to explode. 
We see on the HUD it says dud, and that's letting us know that our fusing is not set up correctly, and we need to fix that. So to do that, we want to go to the stores page, and then on the left-hand side, it says M-Fuse and E-Fuse for the mechanical and electronic fusing for the weapon. We want to go to M-Fuse and select Nose, and E-Fuse and set Instant. Beautiful. All right. Now, let's go ahead and fence in. So master arm on and external lights off. So that way, we are set up and ready to go for combat. One thing I, I neglected to tell you to do is on your HSI page, down on your MPCD, go ahead and press the HSI button on the top right so you go back to your navigational page. There you go. Now you can see your navigation again. All right. And you said turn off external lights? Yes. There is actually a switch on your throttle that you can map to your HOTAS in DCS that is a toggle switch that that turns on or off all of the external lights on your aircraft. So if you'd like to map that, we can wait here. Yeah, let's map. Let's look at map that. Alrighty, no problem. Give me a give me a sec to pause. Okay, we're paused. So it is called external exterior light switch on slash off. It's by default L on your keyboard. And so if you have kind of a button that's kind of out of your way on the throttle, like a way off to the side, that's a good that's a good place to put it. Awesome. Great job. So one thing that I've noticed about your your seating position in the in the aircraft, just looking at your stream here. Um, and if I'm off because the stream is a little weird, then no problem. But I recommend trying to fly the jet a little more zoomed out. The way I like to set up my cockpit is I like to have the bottom row of OSB buttons on my two DDIs at the bottom part, just barely touching the bottom of my screen, and then as much of the canopy bow in my picture as possible. So about, if you can see my, yeah, about right there is where I usually fly the aircraft from. And the more you're zoomed in, the more you kind of get tunnel vision, right? But the more you're kind of zoomed out in a normal seating position in the aircraft, the more likely you are to see like a threat coming at you, like a MiG or a SAM launch or something of that nature. It's just artificially limiting your situational awareness the more you're zoomed in, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. Cool. All right. So we'll go ahead and unpause again. All right. So the aircraft is flying us towards waypoint three still. So that's perfect. Um, on our HUD, we have some new symbology. Do you see that? vertical line coming out of your velocity vector? Yes. That is called your fall line. And essentially that line is how we aim dumb bombs. A lot of people think that we aim the bombs with the cross that comes up that line called the CCIP cross. However, we don't. We actually use the line to, to um, aim our weapons. What we do is we want to fly the jet to put that nice long vertical line somewhere on our target. We then wait for the cross to come up from the bottom of that line, and then once it crosses over our target, that's when we press the weapon release button to drop the bomb and have the weapon impact the target. All right, so we're almost at waypoint three. Let's fly to waypoint four. All right, so see how much more gentle the jet flew at that time? Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, so we have an indicator as to how far the CCIP cross is below the field of view of our HUD, and that is the little um, horizontal line that's crossing the fall line. Do you see that guy? The one with the like upturned wing kind of things? Yeah, so that's the pull-up cue. It's your velocity vector gets below 
the little wing lines, then you're going to receive a big X on your HUD and Betty is gonna say, pull up, pull up, and let you know that you're in danger of hitting the ground. So that, because if you get target fixation, then that is gonna be a good reminder to be like, hey dummy, pull, pull away from the ground, you're gonna crash. Um, but the other little horizontal line, the one that's just a straight flat horizontal line, is a representation of how far below the field of view of your HUD the actual CCIP crosses, which is your aim, your uh, not your aiming device, your uh, timing device of when to press the pickle button. So the lower down to the bottom of the fall line that horizontal line gets, the closer your CCIP reticle is to actually popping up onto your field of view of your HUD. I like to use the autopilot a lot in the F-18 when I have wingmen with me, because as you can see, the jet flies very steady, very gracefully while being flown by the autopilot. And so your wingmen have a really easy time staying with you. So if you look off your left shoulder, you'll see me right in formation with you. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And the jet's gonna start rolling out. Beautiful. All right, so we're now flying out towards a armored divisions assembly point here in Damascus. And what we'll do is we'll skip waypoint four and we'll fly direct waypoint five. Now that'll take us to Damascus International Airport. And that way we'll have a nice big airport to drop our bombs on. A big target that's easy to see. Let's go ahead and select waypoint five. Nice, nice, nice. And go ahead and kick off your autopilot. And let's climb up to an altitude of 18,000 feet. And I'm now off of your right hand side. Kind of undershot the altitude just a little bit there. Okay, so do you see those fires off of the left-hand side of your nose at about 11 o'clock, 11.30ish? Yeah. So that's Damascus International Airport, and that's where we're gonna be dropping our bombs. There's a whole bunch of airplanes on the ramp down there that we're gonna be using as targets. There's no AAA, there's no SAMs, it's just a nice open range for you to uh, just practice dropping your bombs. Now the best way to drop a dumb bomb is to use what's called a roll-in maneuver, where we stay offset to the right-hand side or the left-hand side of the target, and then we roll almost inverted and pull our nose down onto the target, roll back wings level, and that should give us a nice steep dive angle. Wait for that CCIP cross to get up onto our HUD, drop our bomb, and then pull up hard to get away from the target. There's a few reasons why we do this. Positive Gs are far better for our aircraft as well as our bodies. It's far more comfortable than pushing the stick forward for negative Gs. We can see the target because it's not disappearing under our nose. And we are not going to run into our own bombs on the way down the chute because we're pulling positive Gs. And if we accidentally release a weapon, we're gonna be pulling back on the stick, getting away from those bombs rather than flying in formation with them or pushing the aircraft down into a bomb that's already released. So I'll tell you when to start the rolling because I'm in a nice tight formation with you here. 
Let's push up the speed a little. Let's go for about 400 indicated if we can. Alright. And start to roll in, start almost upside down to the left. And pull back on the stick, pull back, pull back, pull back. There you go. We're now on the dive. You see those fires down there on the nose? Beautiful. Good job. Keeping that dive. Pull back on the power a little bit. We're going pretty darn fast. Try and drop your bombs on the base of one of those fires down there if you can. You're just looking for that CCIP cross to crawl up that fall line. Once it crosses your target, press the pickle button. Nice. Weapon away. Good separation. Pull up, pull up, pull up. Get away from that target. There's people down there who want to kill you, right? Very good job. So remember, I told you to pull the power back on the way down, but now we're nose up coming back up. we got to push that power forward so we don't get too slow. We want to make sure that we stay probably at or above 400 knots whenever we're flying in combat. So that way, we don't have to worry about getting... not having enough energy to evade a threat. Nice. We'll climb back up to 18,000. We'll build up some separation away from waypoint 5 since waypoint 5 is on top of our target. We'll turn back around and we'll do it again. The steeper the dive, the quicker our CCIP cross is going to come back up on the HUD, which means that we can drop the bomb from a higher altitude. That's important because the lower we get, the more types of weapon systems will be able to reach up and kill us. Everything from heavy AAA to a kid on the ground with a BB gun if we get too low. All right, nice, looking good. All right, let's go ahead and let's make a turn to the left or the right, your choice, and we'll head back towards waypoint five. It's looking good. So on this time, when we egress away from the target area, once we drop the bomb, let's pull up and turn as we're pulling up. Because if we can get multiple axes of change from the point of view of a gunner down below us, then it'll be even harder for him to hit us with his anti-aircraft gun. So if we're turning and climbing, that's the best thing we can do. Cool. Try not to dive yet. Don't dive yet. Don't dive yet. We want to stay high, and we want to stay offset to the left or to the right of the target. Nice. Don't dive yet. So see how, from your perspective, you can't see the target anymore? Yeah. Come 15 degrees right. But that's what we want to avoid, right? We can't see the target, we can't drop a bomb on it. More importantly, we can't see the people down there trying to kill us. So see, now you can start to see some of those fires down there. So come a little bit further right. Then roll back out. And start that dive down on the target. Nice, there you go. So that's why we want to avoid flying right at the target, because we won't be able to see it.
Weapon away. Nice. And you're turning and climbing this time. I like it. Beautiful. Good job. Alright, you got two more chances, you got two more bombs left. So see how you're pushing forward on the stick to get back to the horizon? Yeah. Try to do some climb again for me, and this time instead of pushing that nose forward to get back down to the horizon, just roll your jet up onto a knife edge, 90 degree bank. And see how your nose starts falling down to the horizon? Ah, uh, yeah. Yep. If you're a real pilot in the jet, that would be a lot more comfortable than pushing forward on the stick. Negative Gs suck. They feel terrible. And your aircraft is stressed for positive Gs rather than negative Gs. And when you roll up onto that knife edge, you're descending without even putting any stresses on the aircraft or your body. Pretty cool, right? Yes. So what you're doing there is all of the force of lift coming out of your wings is basically going straight up through the top of your canopy. You can think of it that way. And then when you roll up onto a knife edge, no more lift is going up. It's all in the horizontal, so your aircraft then falls down to earth. All right. I'm on back up to 18,000 for another bomb run. And let's turn her back around to the target area. Now, normally in a combat situation, like in one of my missions, if you're tasked with dropping dumb bombs, you want to drop all four of these bombs in one pass. One pass, haul ass kind of situation. The reason being is the more times we re-attack a target, the more likely it is we're going to get shot down. Nice. Good job being offset away from the target. See how you can see it now? So we want to wait, come just a few more degrees to the right. We want to wait until that target down there touches our canopy bow from our perspective in the cockpit, and then that'll be a perfect time to start that rolling. About right now, go for it. Nice, good job. Waiting for that cross. Nice. And pull off. Nice job. Okay, we got a little extra gas. Want to try playing around with the targeting pod? All right, so let's climb back up to, let's go for 15,000 feet. Ah, scratch that, we'll go back up to 18,000. This is gonna be a little more switchology intensive, but it'll be great, because we already know how to use the autopilot, so we can use that to our advantage. 
So what we'll do is we'll set up kind of a lazy orbit around the target area. And we have our targeting pod on our belly station, which is nice because the targeting pod hangs down underneath everything on our jet. So we won't have to worry about masking the pod quite as much. When using the targeting pod, you want to stay pretty far away from your target area. If you get too close to it, then your your targeting pod's not going to like that very much because it's going to try. To, it's going the little motors and gimbals inside of it are going to have to work a lot harder to give you the same thing, and so you may have a hard time finding targets if you're too close to a target area. So we're about uh, ten miles out. Go ahead and turn right to a heading of about two three zero. I'm going to turn left, and so that way we won't run into each other. Go ahead and when you're ready, turn your auto throttle on at an airspeed that you desire. And then also turn barometric altitude hold on in your autopilot. Cool. And if you look off to your right, you should see our target area. Perfect, right there. All right, so on your right-hand DDI, or your left, it really doesn't matter, but uh, this works for now. Go ahead and go to the menu page and then click on the FLIR button up on the top right. Yeah, your TAC menu, there you go. Okay, so we now need to tell the targeting pod where to look. We've got a couple different options for that. On the right hand side, we have VVSLV, where the pod will be slaved to our velocity vector up on our HUD. So we can actually, let's say, point our nose at a target and then designate it with the targeting pod. But the easiest way to do it is to simply go down to our HSI, and since we already have Waypoint 5 selected, we can tell the jet that Waypoint 5 is our target that we want the targeting pod to look at by clicking the WPDSG button for Waypoint Designate. Okay, that's cool. Yep. Um, so one thing that we need to fix here though is our waypoint is currently up in the sky above the airport rather than down on the ground at the airport, which is kind of a problem. So the way we can fix that is pretty easy. On our, um, on our HSI, we want to click on data. We want to then go to the UFC button on the top left and give me one second get our altitude for the airport at damascus and then we want to okay it's 2008 so go to elevation click on the little circle for elevation uh click feet and then type in 2008 enter cool and so go back to the hsi click on hsi all right, and then go ahead and hit, click the undesignate button on your stick. Cool, now we can hit waypoint designate one more time. And we should be pointed right at the airport. So the reason why we are not able to see the airport at the moment and the targeting pod is blanked out is because the targeting pod is trying to look behind you and it can't see through its own body. So if you turn the aircraft 90 degrees right by just moving the stick to the right, not, not 90 degrees of bank, but 90 degrees on the heading. There you go. <laughs> that may have kicked off your autopilot. Yep, so you got an autopilot caution Annunciator, so go ahead and click autopilot again, A slash P, and then click barometric altitude hold. There you go. And then roll out, just a nice gentle bank here. 
scroll out a little. Cool, cool, cool. Right there, just leave that bank there and make sure you get barometric altitude hold turned back on. All right, so now we have to tell the jet that we want to use our right DDI to control the targeting pod. So the way we do that is we use the sensor control switch and we want to go sensor control switch right. Do you have the sensor control switch mapped? Yeah, I think I might have hit it the wrong way now. Yeah, that was your weapon select switch. So you selected gun. So it's very simple. Just go back to air to ground mode. So I'll pause it for you so you can get that rebound. So it's called sensor control switch left, forward, right, aft, and depress. Cool. So I'll unpause it here. You just need to navigate back to your FLIR pod page. And we can see that the pod is pointed right at our airport that we were just bombing. We can see that evidenced by the fires in the field of view of the targeting pod. So go sensor control switch right. So you see the little diamond that popped up on the uh, right DDI? Yes. Cool. That is letting you know that you ha now have your your uh, your throttle designator controller is slaved to your targeting pod on that screen. So you can now move your targeting pod around using the throttle designator controller. And using the zoom arrows, you can zoom the pod in and you can zoom it out. You can also change the field of view by clicking on the wide button, top left. Left, top, there you go. And really zoom it in. And then zoom it out. This is how, what you would use to basically guide a laser guided bomb or find a target for a JDAM, etc. So go ahead and move it down. And let's see if we can find an interesting target here. Move, keep moving it down. There you go, see, see the aircraft on the ramp there? And now, go ahead and put the crosshair over one of those aircraft. Now, to set that aircraft as a target, you go throttle designator controller depress. Oh, that's, uh, that was the wrong thing. I gotta see which one I have a map. Yeah. Yep. Pausing. That's a uh, yeah. So it's gonna be throttle des. Yep. Depress. Yeah. There it is. Let me know when you're ready for the unpause. Yep. All right. So our targeting pod's blanked out now, not because you did anything wrong, but because we masked the targeting pod. Your target's behind you again. So turn about 90 degrees to your left. Left, 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 left. There you go. So not with your bank angle, but just turn the jet gently and just let it turn to the left, and we should unmask your targeting pod here in just a sec. So if you look at your F2 view of your jet while you're, while you're turning here, if you zoom in on your belly on the targeting pod, so the eyeball of the pod is that ball on the front of it. So if you fly directly over your target, that ball is gonna rotate back into its body again, and it's not gonna be able to see anything. And that's why it goes blank like that. So you just have to maneuver your aircraft so that way that ball, the eyeball of the pod, can see the target again. 
and that's why being far away from the target is ideal. So that way you can just zoom way in and not have to worry about blanking the target quite as much. So you should be able to see something now. Hop back into your cockpit. There you go. And so we can see obviously we're at a different point of view from the target because we've just maneuvered around. And try moving your, your uh, crosshairs to the left a little. Is it not moving? Ow. Okay, go sensor control switch right again. Oh, that's your that's your weapon select switch. So go back to air to ground. Go back to the FLIR page. There you go. So that just reset the field of view of the pod. So now you're back where you started and you just have to find that target again. So zoom out on your pod. Yeah, when you're zoomed out, you'll be able to see more, obviously, so you can kind of get bearings on where the pod is looking. So you're in narrow field of view, so it's really zoomed in. Go ahead and zoom it out. There you go. Now we can see the airport a little bit better. Kind of get your crosshairs in the general vicinity and then zoom it back in. We can also change the mode that the pod is in. So there's a button labeled CCD on the bottom left there. Go ahead and click that and we can go to the thermal camera. So that doesn't look so great. So go ahead and use the con the contrast uh, knob on the bottom right of the bezel and move that around. And now we're using a thermal camera so we can see in the dark to find targets. You just have to adjust that contrast to be able to see stuff. And so to set that aircraft there as a target for say dropping a bomb on it or uh, being able to see it as a stored target or even me being able to see where your pod is looking, just hit TDC depress. And your symbology changes there to that little diamond. That's letting you know that that point on the ground there where that airplane is, is now your target. And if you turn on your HMD and you look outside the cockpit, See that big, long arrow on the field of view of your HMD? Yeah. Yep, that's pointing you towards the target. And there should be a nice diamond on the ground. Right now, it's underneath your aircraft, so that's why you can't see it. And then if you move the pod again, you're going to have to redesignate that point on the ground by clicking your TDC depress and setting that point as your target. And if you roll back to the right hand side, you'll be able to see your target through your HMD. So roll about 30 degrees of bank to the right. And look over your right shoulder. Keep going, keep looking further. Look further, look further. That's not your airport. That's your airport. So keep looking further to your right. See, see that diamond on the ground? Yep. That's where your targeting pod is looking. And if I look through my HMD, I can see where your targeting pod is looking. So therefore, I can then use my HMD to get my targeting pod directly on top of where yours is looking, which is super cool. So we can collaborate with attacking targets. So say if you're out of weapons, but I still have a weapon, I can clobber that target for you if you've already found it for me. So how much gas do you have left? Cool. All right. Why don't we go ahead and head on back to our, or do you want to see me bomb the target through your, because I have one bomb left. Do you want to see me bomb the target through your targeting pod? That'd be pretty cool. Sure. All right. 
Stand by, I'm 40 seconds out. Thirty seconds out. All right, and you're in perfect position now to make sure that your pod isn't going to be blanked out as I'm attacking the target. So I'm just dropping a dumb bomb here. So hopefully my attack will be accurate, but we shall see. And. Weapon is away. And my weapon didn't come off, crap. Well left, well left. Well, you should be able to see Altitude. it explode down there. Altitude. Yeah, I saw it explode. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so pretty cool, right? Yeah. Um, and Basically, that's kind of covers the basics of the targeting pod. And then from there, you know, it just gets a couple little things about maneuvering the aircraft and, and using the actual um, laser in the pod to say designate for a laser guided bomb, things like that. But anyway, I'm low on gas now. So let's go ahead and head on back to King Hussein Air College and make a landing. So go ahead and fly towards Let's go fly towards waypoint uh, seven for me, and I will join back up on you. <whistles> on the way back to our airport, we'll talk about a couple other cool things about the Hornet. I think you're flying away from waypoint seven right now. Yeah, I think so too. Okay, it's just gently bringing you back around. So if you don't want to wait for the uh, autopilot to do its thing, you can just simply fly your jet manually to the waypoint. And about to cross each other, so I'm gonna get back to the turn to get back in formation with you. Cool. All right, so yeah, now you're flying towards the waypoint, so that's perfect. Okay, so let's say that uh, we are in real trouble and we're low on gas and we've been shot at or maybe our aircraft is damaged and we just can't have all of this weight on the aircraft anymore. Don't do it now, but you can press that push to jet, that yellow push button that's black and yellow underneath your master arm switch to jettison all of your external stores except for the sidewinders on your wingtips as well as any AMRAMs or Sparrows that are on your cheek stations. And no um, targeting pods cannot be jettisoned. So everything else would be jettisoned off of your aircraft. Um, so that would be kind of an emergency situation. But if we had to jettison something off of our aircraft more selectively, like say you're getting into combat and you've been jumped by some MiGs and you got to get rid of those external uh, tanks, but you want to keep your bombs so you can potentially finish your bombing mission after you shoot down the MiGs, we can select which stations to jettison. So in order to do that, on the left-hand side of your IFE, there is a jettison station select panel. 
to get rid of our fuel tanks, let's select the L1 and R1 buttons. And then the select jet button, which is the red button just above your parking brake, has an outer kind of silver wheel on it. We want to move it to the stores position with a couple right clicks. And then when you press the jet button, that red button, your external fuel tanks will come away. And boom, there go your fuel tanks. And your jet is now a heck of a lot more maneuverable and a lot less draggy. Keep in mind though that uh, it's not really the norm to drop your fuel tanks if you are in a kind of a normal situation because squadrons don't really deploy with all that many of them so you're expected to bring them home unless there's a reason for you to get rid of them such as an emergency or an air-to-air -air engagement or something of that nature now there's a couple other really cool features about the hornet that allow you to stretch the aircraft's endurance and range as much as possible and that's called the f pass page so if you go to your support menu and then click on F-Pass. I believe F-Pass stands for Flight Performance Advisory System, but don't quote me on that. When you look at that page, F-Pass, left, bottom. Um, and then if, you, if that new color of the DDI bugs you, you can use that contrast knob on the bottom right of the bezel of that screen to get back to that kind of more neutral green color. I don't know why that bugs me, but it does. <laughs> um, what this allows you to do is see different metrics to allow you to fly to a um, waypoint or to get to a point where you have the maximum range and the maximum endurance out of your current fuel load that you have on the aircraft. So right now we currently have waypoint seven selected and it says nav two waypoint seven and it gives us a time of how long it's gonna take us to get there, the fuel remaining when we do get there and the pounds burned per nautical mile. So that way we can kind of plan out our fuel usage and know, hey, when I get to my target waypoint, I'm gonna have X amount of fuel left to be able to fight with, things of that nature. Um, below that line is kind of like our optimum uh, metrics. So for optimum range or optimum endurance, it gives you an altitude to fly at, a Mach number to fly at, and a time till you get to 2000 pounds at those optimum altitudes and mocks, which is pretty cool. We also get a caution and advisory when we get to a certain point where the F-Pass page is thinking, uh-oh, we don't have enough fuel to get home. And so that's why we have the little home option on the button on the bottom right. So we can select up or down which waypoint is our home base. So if you are flying along and that thing is yelling at you a ton and telling you giving you cautions and advisories every time you move your throttle you can select a new home waypoint that is closer to you so that way it doesn't yell at you so much so i do that quite a bit when i know i'm going to have a tanker or an intermediate base i can land at so i don't have to worry about my gas too much make sense yes cool so that's a really, really useful tool. And I use it all the time, especially after, usually after a strike. And I'm like, oh geez, can I make it home to the carrier? Do I have to hit a tanker? All of that good stuff. So we're getting closer to our home base here. So why don't we go ahead and let's start a gentle descent. Let's bring it down to 5,000 feet, about five degrees nose down. and make sure we fence out. So make sure we get our master arm set to safe. I like to bring up my FCS page again, as well as my HUD repeater page.
Now let's go ahead and start to slow the jet as well. Let's bring the airspeed down to about 300 knots indicated. So you can see how much more slippery your jet is now that you've gotten rid of those external tanks, right? You can go a lot faster, a lot easier. The waypoint seven is going to be get us nice and lined up with the runway. So we're going to turn from waypoint seven to waypoint eight. What we can also do is we can actually draw a course line that's going to correspond with our runway at our airport. We can do this with both a TACAN and a waypoint. So go ahead and select waypoint eight. And then at the top right of your MPCD bezel, there's a thing labeled CRS. You want to click and hold on that until you get CSEL pop up on your UFC. You want to click on that guy and then enter in a heading of 310 degrees and enter. And that'll paint a nice course line on your HSI for our runway. Cool. Then you can bring up the HSI on, say, one of your DDIs, so it's a little easier to see. And you can zoom in the scaling with the center top button so you can see the line a little bit easier. And basically what that did for us is if we fly our jet on top of that line, it'll bring us straight into the runway. At about 5,000? Yep, exactly. That'll be perfect because that'll be give us about 3,000 feet AGL, which will be perfect for our run into our airbase. Have you done any overhead breaks to landing or are you mostly just straight ins? Well, practicing both of them. Okay. Uh, do you want to do an overhead or a straight in? Altitude. Um, probably overhead. Altitude. Alrighty. All right, let's start making that right-hand turn to get onto that line and follow that line into our home base. Okay, so that line wasn't perfect. I can see our airfield at our 11 o'clock. You see the runway? Uh, not yet. Right on our nose. Okay, yeah, I see it. Cool. All right, so let's go ahead and fly it just like a carrier brake. So go ahead and bring us down to 800 feet AGL. You can use your radar altimeter for that if you need to. And we'll go for 350 knots. Obviously the hook's going to be up because we're at an airfield. Altitude. Altitude. Kind of offset slightly to the right of the runway, so go ahead and come left a little bit so we can get back into line with it. Nice, nice, nice. Keep bringing us down, looking for 800 feet AGL. Good airspeed, I like it. Nice. 
Nice. Good job. Nice. Just a hair low. About 100 feet low. All right, go ahead and break over the middle of the runway. Oop, that was a little early, but that's okay. Why well, something set wrong? Because it's showing 2,900. Oh, gotcha. You just have to turn on your radar altimeter. I will show you how to do that in just a moment. Because usually when you do this, right, the aircraft carrier is at sea level. So it's not a concern, but because we have a field elevation about 2,200 feet, we either have to do some mental math or we just need to turn on our radar altimeter on our HUD. So it popped up a little high on that. So just make sure that when you're in a break like that, you're really trying hard to keep your velocity vector right on the horizon so that way when you're in the brake you're not climbing and try to anticipate that balloon effect from the flaps right so either push the stick forward or let out on some power whatever you need to do to try and get that ballooning effect out of the flaps to go away and you're going way out there for your downwind so go ahead and turn towards the runway Did you get your gear gear and flaps down? Remember that when you're on the downwind, which is where you're paralleling the runway after the break, you need to start slowing the aircraft down, get your gear and flaps down. And so that way you can turn immediately to the runway and land the aircraft. Just pull just a little bit of power and give a little bit of nose up trim. We want to try and get your velocity vector in the E bracket on your HUD. Because that's going to give you that perfect angle of attack for landing. And you'll also notice that when you get your velocity vector up into your E bracket, you're going to get that nice yellow donut on your AOA indicator or angle of attack indicator. And you'll be perfect for landing. You just want to gently use that throttle to keep that velocity vector on the runway. We're in what's called the region of reverse command, where we're using that throttle for our altitude and our stick is for our speed. So you got too much throttle, that's why you're floating up. So see how high you are? Yeah. Too fast, too high. Would it be helpful to watch me stream while I land the aircraft? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and pause and I'm going to stream. You can go ahead and go back to spectators in DCS, and that way you can just easily watch my stream without having to worry about uh, the um, without having to worry about uh, crashing the jet or anything. All right, I'm going to. How do I? Why won't it let me stream? There it goes. All right, screen, screen one, go live.
Cool. Let me know when you can see my screen. All right, I'm going to go ahead and go around here. Get some more airspeed. All right, I'm seeing like an AWAX. Oh, I meant watch my stream on Discord. Like, don't worry about oh, okay. DCS, yeah. So that way you can see my cockpit. All right, so I also have my controls indicator up, which is that red box on the bottom right of my screen. So you, that way you can see where my rudder is, my stick, as well as my throttles. Can you see my screen? Yeah, I got you. Okay, perfect. All right. Betty doesn't like how low on gas I am. That's okay, I'm gonna land in just a second. Okay, so there's my airport over there. One thing I did notice as you were flying your aircraft was you tend to look forward a lot, right? We know what's happening here because we're flying a jet. Don't be afraid to look over your shoulder. I can keep track of where that airport is just by looking over my shoulder there. So we'll go ahead and we'll turn back towards our airport into the upwind. Really try to practice keeping that velocity vector on the horizon as you turn, right? So that way we can avoid climbing while we are turning. So there's our airport over there. All right, so what I was talking about with the radar altimeter is this switch right here. We can switch from barometric to radar. And when we have a little R next to our altitude box, that's letting us know we're using our radar altimeter for the source there. And that's showing us how high above the ground we are. So there's our airfield. So we're now what's called the in what's called the upwind leg of the traffic pattern. I get to slow down to the normal 350 knots. And feel a little turbulence there coming off the desert, which is totally normal. Going for about 800 feet over the runway. There we go. So you can see my jet shaking from the turbulence there. At an airfield, we kind of want to break over midfield. So once we're over the middle of the runway, and we're going to roll, throttle idle, and we're going to pull, not super hard, just about three Gs worth of pull that we can see there on the HUD. Trying to keep that velocity vector right on the horizon to maintain our altitude. We're going to drop the flaps, drop our gear, Keep an eye on where that runway is. We're gonna roll out. Power still at idle. I'm gonna push forward on the stick. See how those flaps wanna balloon me up? Pushing forward on the stick. And then as the jet slows down, we're gonna naturally need to pull, it, bring in more and more power and start to bring in some nose up trim. So you can see my throttles are starting to come up almost to around 70% there on the controls indicator. Starting to get that velocity vector up into the E bracket. Looking over my shoulder, and when the runway is about 45 degrees behind my wing, that's when I'm going to start turning. So we can go ahead and start to turn. In the turn, we're going to need extra power because we are killing some of our vertical component of lift. Just a nice, gentle, about 30 degree bank. Looking over my shoulder, a little too much power. So we know we have too much power when we see our velocity vector climb above the horizon. So we just need to pull back on the power a little bit to let that velocity vector come back down. We want to always be nice and gentle with the throttle movements. We never want to bring the power all the way to idle, and we never want to bring the power all the way to full. The GE F404 engine in the F18 has a long spool up time. So if we move the throttle to idle and we start sinking like this, oh shit, it takes a long time for those engines to develop power to arrest that descent. So as we start to come down, we just want to be nice and gentle with those throttles, always moving the throttles, always, it's called stroking the throttles in the way that you're always moving them back and forth just to get what you want. Start to get that velocity vector on the runway. I'm a little high. 
right on speed though. Just keeping that velocity vector right on the runway. Look, on the controls indicator, you can see my stick is nice and centered, right in the center there. I'm just using the throttle to maneuver my jet rather than using the stick. Just moving the stick left and right, just nice and gently to get a little bit back on a center line. Looks like we're gonna be right in the touchdown zone. It's a little bit of power into the touchdown. Ah, eh, off the center line, crap. And power to idle as we're rolling down the runway. Sp speed break out. And if we pull the stick all the way aft once we're slow enough, that can help slow us down as well. And of course, getting on the brakes helps. So does that help make it make any sense of how to how to land? Absolutely. Awesome. So in aircraft, there, there's this weird thing where once you're slow enough, you get into what's called that region of reverse command where moving your throttles is how you control your up and down, your altitude. And then you don't want to pull back or push forward on the stick too much because that kind of messes up that whole kind of situation if you had it perfect with the throttle. You just want to just very gently bank the aircraft left and right to search for that center line. And we want to make sure we don't pull the power all the way to idle. We want to keep that power in, make sure those engines stay spooled up. Make sense? Yes, it does. 